Okay, so you should be kind of looking at, at looking into the nothingness at the moment. And let me get this. Hang on just one second. Um, as Robert said, kind of today is that get the pieces, parts, and in, in, in gaming. Okay, um, and so remember that everything I make up today, uh, I'm making up on my own. Uh, I don't necessarily represent the official position of the War College, government, Navy, etc. Um, and again, we're going to combo platter this. So we'll be talking a bit about uh, the, the elemental part, the pieces, parts, the pucks. Okay, hence the, the, the name of this uh, presentation and the scenarios they live in. Now, again, very overview level. I'm not going to be, uh, you're not going to walk away with this, uh, with this in-depth knowledge of how to break down maps into hex grids and whether or not you should make aircraft carry as a seven on a, on a token and the destroyers should be a five. Okay, I'm going to give you more of the, the theoretical approach to how we think about these problems because not everybody's problem boils down to orders of battle on a map, right? Uh, you may have other situations where you're trying to think what would be the relevant manipulables? What, what would be the things that the players are making decisions about? How do I identify those and how do I fit them within the context of the scenario? So while I tend to think um, board game centric that everything is a piece and there's a board involved uh, and then most of the stuff I have to do is war related. So those pieces tend to be orders of battle, planes, trains, tanks, et cetera. Um, this should be applicable across a variety of uh, interest areas. So we'll go on for about an hour. We'll do about 30 minute Q&A at the end. Um, and we are recording this uh, and we will then post this along with all the rest of them and the uh, PDF version of the brief to tabletophistory.net. Okay, so. What the fuck <laughs> is the name of this, uh, this briefing? Um, as uh, Robert said, I'm currently, uh, I'm with uh, uh, Valiant Integrated Services providing support to the U.S. Naval War College as their lead for design and adjudication. Uh, other topics, and I tell you, the one that most naturally follows from this one, and we'll look at this potentially as lecture eight, um, will be adjudication. Uh, because there's a lot of overlap on how you think about creating the pucks and creating the scenario and the relationships are essentially rule sets and rules kind of lead you into, into adjudication. So uh, the first part, we will focus on this idea of the pucks. Uh, and the relationships you need to establish with the pucks. And part two then is the world in which those pucks live, the scenarios behind it, as well as, uh, well, I'll close with a piece on, on road to conflict or road to crisis or road to war, whatever you wanna call that kind of that preamble we end up making that leads players into a game and some thoughts along those lines. Um, now, pucks, I, I keep referring to pucks and there's a little bit of history that goes with that. So the term pucks, uh, kind of goes back to some of the early days of wargaming where the, the military forces that were being represented in a war game are often on these just you know, these discs, pucks of different colors representing different forces, different sides. Um, they may have models attached and whatnot. And kind of the classic mental image that you could draw from puck pushing are the days of World War II. Um, this is uh, from Fighter Command uh, in Britain during the Battle of Britain. And this idea of pushing those pucks around on the big map, representing where enemy bomber formations were, where friendly fighter formations were, and that act of pushing the pucks is where pucksters, puck pushers, where this terminology comes from. Uh, and so now we tend to apply it generically just about anything uh, that is in a war game that isn't the player and isn't the map is a puck. So what we're gonna talk about, um, is this idea about how do we think, how do we generate pucks? How do we think about pucks? Um, and what are the attributes that we need to represent with a puck? Because not everything that you could represent is necessarily of value to gameplay. Um, now, again, as I said before, I tend to think along the lines of a war problem. Uh, so a lot of what I'm gonna kind of lay out here is from that, that military, particularly naval perspective. So you have to start thinking about if we're gonna have something in the game, then it's gotta be more than just a hollow shell of itself. It actually has to have functionality, uh, which means that there's a reason the players wanna make a decision about its employment. It can do things, it has characteristics, it has attributes, which contribute towards whatever the game's objective is. Um, and so from a military perspective, a naval perspective, obviously things like the offensive capability of the puck. 
Um, does it have a defensive nature, armor, minute, something that offsets the offensive capability of the opposing pucks? Um, are we interested in the physical weight, shape, size, color of these things? Maybe we are, maybe we aren't. Dynamic features like speed of maneuver, uh, how far can it go, endurance, um, and then any other uh, attribute that ultimately you're going to think that you're going to be asking yourself, is it important for the players to be aware of that and to make a decision about that? And then how are we going to show it, by the way? I mean, here on the page, um, this is right out of uh, Jane's Fighting Ships. Uh, Fred Jane uh, was a war gamer, first and foremost, long before the, the, the Jane publishing empire and the, the, the world of fighting ships, fighting everything else. Um, Fred was simply making pages that updated his war game. And so when a new dreadnought was launched by Germany, when a new frigate came out from the Norwegians, um, he would then convert that real world shipping information, that you know, characteristics of that frigate of that dreadnought and convert it into these standardized pages that you'd be used in his game. And it highlighted the information that was on there was specific to the Fred Jane game system. Uh, and that's why you see in this one where there's a hash area representing the armor box, why the turrets are a slightly different color, why the bottom of the hull is even numbered, okay? Because that went to the way Fred allocated hits and did the hit process. So it's more than just how do I accurately, and I'm not terribly interested in accuracy per se, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the realism discussion. Um, it's how do I represent things in a way that's meaningful for gameplay and supports my game's objectives. Uh, and sometimes it just boils down to the fact that you're going to have to come up with how many, what type, weapons, that sort of thing um, is going to be in your game. The question is whether you can live between this end of the spectrum, which is relatively simple, or do you have to live at this end of the spectrum in a high degree of complexity uh, in terms of how you represent the pucks in the game? And which you do, realize that the, the more pucks you have, the more complicated they are. That complexity drives up your time. The time it's going to take you to put together the game, the time it's going to take to execute the game, the time it's going to take to try to do any assessment to it and do any analysis. So there's a trade-off here. People often say, well, you know, adding this complexity will make it more real. It's like, okay, well, I'm not interested in real. I'm not interested in one-to-one -one time. I'm not interested in having every single facet of a particular thing represented when the players are only going to make a decision about a small handful. I got into this argument once when we were doing some gaming with, uh, and China was the adversary. And uh, I'm thinking primarily about the, the, the Navy and someone saying, well, you know, you really need to represent the Mountain Corps, the Mountain Division or whatever. And of course, I'm not, a, I'm not an uh, army guy. And I kept thinking, why? Well, well because they, they're, they're there. I, I, I get that they're there, but I don't know that anyone's gonna play with it. Well, you gotta have them. It's, it's really important to have them to represent more completely the, the um, total military power of the PLA or the PRC. Okay. Now, after the game, since we're using the, the War College's gaming system, I can go back and look at utilization rates. I can tell you how many times who touched what puck in the game digitally, right? And of all the, and we, we had an order of battle measured in the thousands, only 30% of it was used in the course of the game. Okay? So just because it's there doesn't mean you have to put it in. <laughs> Okay, um, and you should be making very conscious decisions about why you're playing with what you're playing, because that's what your job is as a designer, is what, not just to put it in, but to put it in in a meaningful way that you can connect its existence back to something that the player is likely to be making a decision about. Remember the board gaming part of this, um, there's always a, a little budgeteer running around in the back of my head, because in the commercial side of the house, everything costs. Everything I put in that box that you're going to pull off the shelf at your favorite uh, toy and hobby shop is going to cost me to put in. And there's only so much I can raise the price to comp that in terms of my profit margin before you think the game is too expensive. So I've got to be very uh, judicious in my choice of what's going into the game, right? Because there is, in that case, a real profit margin that's going to be paying. Well, the problem when we get into some of these military types games is because there's nothing to pay. We're not paying for this. We tend to just pile stuff in because we can't. You remember some earlier lectures we talked about hanging more ornaments on the Christmas tree, hanging more and more pucks, in, dumping more and more pucks into your game box is not necessarily going to make it a better game. Now, how are you going to go about even starting to think about what you ought to put in the game in terms of pucks? Right? Two approaches, they're very, 
similar. They just kind of come at it from slightly different angles, right? Um, and you're going to see that this is not terribly dissimilar from the conversations we've had uh, in past lectures about how we think about the player relationships and how we think about the way the problem is connected to other pieces, parts, and problems. Uh, it's all of the same approach. It's all about relationships, whether we're talking about the relationships between the players and, and the game cells and who they represent, or the, we're talking about the relationship between the pucks and as entities and how they interact with one another, or the relationship of the problem to broader contexts. It's all about how do things relate. And ultimately that relationship has to lead to a point where a player makes a decision about something. So one way to start this process is just to brainstorm. If we're doing a war game about X, what are the things we can think about that probably ought to be in a game about X? In another way to think of this is, if I were to pick up a game off the shelf um, and I read on the cover that this game is about, you know, uh, World War II, War in the Pacific, Axis and Allies kind of thing, then already you're starting that when I turn this box over and I look at the back or when I open up this box and I look inside, I'm expecting to see certain things. I'm expecting to see a map of the Pacific. I'm expecting to see aircraft carriers and, and naval units. I'm expecting to see representatives of certain forces, right? That, that beginning of what do you expect? What can you think of that might be connected to this problem is what you throw up on the board, right? You just start whiteboarding, chucking these things up at post-it notes. And you just start as, as, as many as you can think of. Do your, do your historical research, do your literature review, grab some subject matter experts, and just toss up stuff, okay? Then you're gonna kind of look at what you got. And you're gonna to start to kind of cluster this stuff together, okay? And try to group it um, together. And let me just, I know that thing, this thing up here sometimes blocks the top of the screen. Um, and we will, let me just hide. Oops. Um, let me hide. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, the you, you're trying to clump stuff together now. You're seeing what you come up with it that had it was in common. Okay. Um, so you're looking for the duplicates, um, and then you start to look at stuff and start to think, yeah, I, I know we put it up there because in the beginning we put everything up there. But are some of these things kind of beyond the scale and scope of what we're playing? I mean, we've got some we got some stuff up there that we're having a relative. We, we think we're going to end up having a relatively operational game. It's going to be focused. Uh, and on the South China Sea, perhaps, and we've put a lot of, uh, of diplomatic stuff in there, and I can see where that would relate, but are the people who are going to come to this game be of the sort that would play the diplomacy half of it? Now, if the answer is yes, you keep it in. If the answer is no, you start to think about throwing it out. So you got to start looking for what's, what do we have in common here, um, and what do we need to take out? Okay. Uh, that's how you start to, to start to pare down what's going in the box. Now, once you kind of do that part, then you've got to start to thinking about some relevant relational characteristics between these pieces parts, okay? Um, and when I say relevant, what I mean is it has to be relevant to the player in that he sees a connection. It may be second, third order, but there's a connection between what it is you've asked him to do in the game, the victory condition he's trying to achieve, and this widget you've given him to play with. And obviously, if I can't see a way to use a widget to achieve the victory condition, why on earth is a widget in the box? Okay, to put it in kind of board gaming terms, all right? Um, so after you've kind of reduced and, and scoped down your pieces parts, and you're trying to start relationships between those pieces parts, okay, and lash them up, um, that there is a relationship. Um, and in this case, like here, we've got the relationship that, you know, um, D gets to stay in the game, so to speak, because D has a relationship with B, and B has a relationship with the victory condition. So B is probably, D rather, is probably worth having in the game, uh, potentially. Um, on the other hand, you look at stuff like uh, our little guy down here, H, and while initially we thought H was, was relevant to play, either we've, we don't understand how it might connect to something, maybe we're missing something, right? Maybe actually there's a connection between H and G. But right now, as it stands, I can't figure out why H would be kept in the game. I understand why it has something to do with the topic, but I can't see a way the player's gonna use that in order to achieve his victory condition in some way. So that's what we call an orphan. It's disconnected from the rest of the family. Right? And it's probably something you're gonna look at chucking out or do more research to find out why you maybe ought to include it in. 
But now that you've kind of built this map of relationships, and I'll show you some examples of stuff I did uh, for some Civil War gaming, right? Um, I'll show you another, it's kind of the same way, but a little bit of a different start to it. Um, rather than just kind of splattering the whiteboard with ideas, um, you're first going to start with your core idea, and you already know that, look, there's, there's probably about three big things that go with this. And for example, I'm having some discussions with some other game designers about Napoleonic warfare games, okay? If you're going to have a war, a, a war game about uh, warfare in the Napoleonic age, okay, then you're already talking about three key things you better have in the game. Infantry, cavalry, artillery. Those are the big three that represent um, militaries of that time period. Right, so you could start with those, but then you say, okay, well, what about the artillery? What about the infantry? Uh, do I need to think about ammunition? Do I need, you know? So then you start to expand outward, okay, from those three or four or five, however many big ideas you have. And then you're gonna start to think, well, what connects to them? And not just what connects to them, but you ought to be all thinking, and why is it important to have that connected to that, okay? And if you get into an artillery discussion, and you decide that for your game, the logistics behind this are important, right? And artillery does not fire forever, okay? Uh, and so there is an ammunition problem, but maybe I'm not quite as interested in the ammunition problem with the infantry. Or someone says, oh no, actually it's more of a problem, okay? Keeping the infantry supplied with cartridges is a bigger problem than the artillery with, with cannon and gunpowder. Maybe it is, bad. but that's what why you're doing this, why you're trying to map out and try to figure out what do I need to have in the game? What needs to be its, its connections and, and relevancy to other pieces parts, okay? And you keep doing this. Now, I don't recommend going much out to about the third tier here, okay? So we did big three, what's connected to that, what's connected to that, the sub-sub-elements. You go much further out, and again, you're gonna run into the problem of everything is connected to everything, and your complexity is going up. Remember back to my early slides. If complexity is going up, the numbers are going up, um, your time to design this and the, and the ability to play this is getting more uh, lengthy and difficult. So again, you're gonna do the same thing you did before. Um, we're looking for the places where there's some sort of overlapping connection between pieces. Um, can we reduce some of these as standalone items? Maybe we need to reshuffle our little diagram a little bit to tighten it up. Having done it either this way or the previous way, you end up with some sort of, of relationship map. Right? And then you can go and kind of sit back and maybe put it into a matrix grid. I do this occasionally, um, especially if I have a lot of parts and I'm looking to trim. Uh, the very beginning of this one, so that whole, we came up with the big three, right? So the big three live up here and they always live up in this corner and represent your key game focus. Everything else was something you added on. Now we're trying to see how many pieces have a relationship or how many parts have a relationship to another part. Because the more connected a piece is, the richer, the more important it seems to be, the gameplay. So then we're looking for folks like uh, down here, L. The little L here only connects to J. It's the only thing he connects to. Uh, so I'm looking for the columns with a onesie in it, or the row with onesies in them, okay? Um, and obviously it mirror images. Uh, and then I start to ask myself, so L becomes one of the first candidates for being chucked over the side. Uh, as I think about paring this down and trying to keep this tight and focused for my players. Now, someone in your design group may say, yeah, but yeah, I, I know L is out there by its lonesome, but without L, there's no way J happens and J is important. Okay, but at least these ought to be conscious decisions that you can rationalize and not just have the rationalization be, well, because it's there in real life. I get it. A lot of things are there in real life, okay, but we're not necessarily representing them in real life, or I should say from real life gets represented in the game. There's a lot of things in real life that we leave out when it comes to focusing our attention on a very specific problem set, okay? So, Again, th these are just kind of, of ways to get your, to give you a mechanical process to start thinking about how you, how you bucket this stuff and how you come up with it and why you keep some stuff and why you throw some stuff over the side. And this is probably right here. The biggest thing in terms of throwing stuff over the side. You should be able to make the case for why what you're keeping in the game is either gonna be something that contributes directly to a player decision, directly to player decision. It's part of the broader order of battle which have relationships to things which are part of the player decision, or it helps enrich the scenario and be careful with scenario enrichment, all right? Enrichment, all right? Because these are things that you start adding as decoration to the game. Now, some decoration uh, can be good, 
but be careful when you start to pile on the features simply because you're trying to make it look cool. Um, and you're adding complexity with no real value added back to the player decision space and the objective he's trying to achieve. Uh, simple idea here is you look at things, you look at games that have maps, and the maps represent some sort of battle space, especially uh, terrain, the dirt side. And I've got a forest. And there's any number of ways I can represent a forest. But I tell you what I'm not going to do. We spend a whole lot of time to trying to decide, well, isn't a forest primarily composed of elk or of oak trees, of elms? Um, is it deciduous? Is it, why are you going into this? All right? People say, well, well, it's kind of fun. Well, maybe it is. But you're, you're, you're devoting energy into something which is relevant, irrelevant to the player. What's more important is, are my troops allowed to move into that area on the map that you've got hash marks that says woods? Or maybe you got a couple of tree, tree icons. But be careful of getting lured off into the, it's fun to make a beautiful terrain. Got it. Miniatures gaming, right? People put a, a, a ton of effort into creating these fabulous, beautiful terrains for their miniatures to fight over. And a lot of time it is just eye candy, but that's their hobby, that they take value out of that activity and it supports their broader objective of the hobby. You're trying to do something for a professional end, then keep it focused on those professional objectives and try to keep yourself tightly adherent to what matters and focus on that. Because there's gonna be parts you're gonna wanna throw out that some people are gonna say, oh my God, you cannot possibly toss that out, right? Usually it's because it's their pet rock. Okay, it's their rice bowl, and they got to see that widget in the game. Otherwise, they question the value of the game. But if you can't make the case, and we've talked about this earlier about, you know, sponsors wanting to jam stuff into your game. If you can't make the case for why that needs to be in there and how it relates to everything else in the game, it's just something that's getting stuck in, just like when we did our player mapping and we looked at the relationship between player cells and we thought of it as a delicately woven spider web. Okay, and you, all of it's been built very carefully and everything has a connection to everything else. And then someone comes along and wants to go and touch your spider web and add something to it. And it never comes out well when you touch spider webs because you ain't gonna make them better okay, by touching them okay, after they've been designed. So be ruthless with this decision about what's in and what's out. I, I would see these conversations in game design, in commercial game design sessions where uh, the, the budgeteer side of the house is looking at how much your game's gonna cost because you wanna have in 50 different types of miniatures. And they're thinking about the cost to sculpt these things and have them produced. And the fact that there's 50 different types of miniatures uh, and you want them in how many different colors? Oh my God, no, Let, let's cut this in half. And you're like, no, you cannot possibly cut it in half. I guess, well, then you can't possibly sell this for anything less than $85 a box. And that's probably a price point too high. Be ruthless, cut it down. You don't have a budget necessary to worry about, but you should be thinking like you do. Now, as you structure these parts and you start to add stuff, you can't just go and throw it in the box without rules to go with it, okay? Otherwise, what's the point of having the thing, okay? Now, to some extent, there's this tendency to want to rely on subject matter expertise to fill in the blanks for your widget. You're saying, look, all I have to do is put tanks in the game and all the people who are coming with an armor background will know how to use the pieces. Maybe, and that might work. But the biggest problem I have with this type of approach is when the folks who are gonna be part of your adjudication, remember I said a lot of this overlaps with adjudication discussions, um, the people who are gonna be trying to quote, adjudicate what happens when that tank goes rumbling along and engages some other uh, group of tanks or infantry, all right? uh, and the guys who are upstairs who are playing the tank, if you're not exactly on the same sheet of music, if you don't both have an, a, an identical, implicit understanding for how that thing on the board called the tank works, then you're using two different rules sets that are, aren't shared by the players, okay? How does that sound like it's gonna be a good game? Okay, it's sort of like playing chess and one player thinks the rooks go horizontal and the other player thinks they go diagonally, all right? One of you is wrong, <laughs> okay? <laughs> You've gotta use the same rule set. Otherwise, you're gonna have a very difficult time trying to adjudicate it. So when we think about these kind of, how do we come up with rule sets? How do we think about the attributes these pucks ought to have? Um, I tend to fall back on operational functions because it's a war game, because I tend to be dealing with orders of battle. And the two most fundamental features of games, whether we're talking about professional war games or commercial war games, is the idea of movement and fires. Move and shoot are like the two most fundamental rules that you need to somehow accommodate for. We'll look at very specific examples of when we do the adjudication lecture on how commercial games implement different parts of this triangle uh, and they don't all have all the parts. Uh, 
So fundamentally, the bottom tends to be movement and fires, right? Now, there's got to be a relationship. And I said relationships matter. So there's some relationship between movement and fires. And, and typically, the, the most fundamental relationship with these two is range in terms of how far can I move, how far can I shoot? And then there's often an interplay between them in terms of about how the fires affects movement. Okay? So if the fires hit a thing, does the thing now move less uh, because it's been hit? Does it move slower? Early naval gaming used this uh, linear in a very linear fashion. It would come up with a rule that said, look, um, based on some crazy algorithm, uh, and every war game had its own algorithm, um, we've decided that a, a dreadnought uh, has a strength of 25. And when she's taken about 12 hits, she'll go half as far and have half her firepower. It was just, just a linear proportional rule that the proportion of strength you had left was the proportion of firepower you had left was the proportion of movement you had left. Now, if you've, <laughs> if you've looked at naval ships and whatnot and thought about how they fight, it doesn't typically go in that kind of fashion. But that, that, that was the way they defined the relationship then. Now, when you want to go past movement and fire, you go, yeah, but we need a little bit more, I think. Usually the next thing you reach for are logistics. And uh, logistics can't just be a bolt-on. Um, pretty much so. You got to think about it in the context of the other rules you've already established. So logistics is usually an easy one because there's a natural linkage you can make between logistics and movement. It tends to be fuel. Okay? Things when we have so much gas, they'll need to be have that fuel replaced at some point. A logistics play in the game thinks about how do I replace that. Your game may not need it. You may be looking at a time frame of play where fuel isn't the limiting factor. Well, then don't go stick it in there if it's not going to be important. But if you're thinking that you're playing out over a great many days um, and there is going to be an issue about keeping that armor, that rapidly moving armor column fueled or replenishing the munitions out on that aircraft carrier, that's the second part, ammunition, then yeah, you start to throw logistics as a attribute and start thinking about how do I link the that logistics attribute to the other rule sets so this is all a coherent whole but again don't just put something on and think about how does this new thing affect the stuff i already have you've got to work backwards and say how did the stuff i already have affect the new thing i just added so is there a rule set that allows the adversary to use fires to disrupt my logistics chain or is my logistics chain totally off board and while i'm accounting for it on um, the game axis and allies guadalcanal Logistics all emanate uh, if you're on the Japanese side from Rabul and if you're on the uh, US side from New Caledonia. Um, and there's no real way to screw with the other guy's logistics center. Okay, it's considered to be somewhat off board. It has its own little separate sideboard that you play off of. And from there, forces come onto the board. But it does represent a limiting factor in how many forces can come off of that little sideboard and at what rate to replace stuff lost in battle. Next thing people tend to want to add is intel of some flavor. Okay, so we got our fourth, our fourth operational function here. Um, and in some ways, this is an easy one because this is where we get into the heart of open and closed intelligence and in games. Okay, so if you think that you want to add intel, part of the way you can make a relationship between intel and movement is, uh, will there be movement that one guy can't see that because he doesn't have the, the sensors? It's a hidden movement game. You only get to see the order of battle that you have a sensor that allows you to see. Right? And that's usually a, a quick tie in then, not only do I not know that you're moving around, um, can I even target you or not? And this is where you get into targeting rule sets and this idea that, well, is detection enough? If, I, if my rule set says I found you, that is sufficient then to shoot you. Or you, or you may have a game that says, well, no, actually I want to exercise the entire uh, kill chain and we have to go through the whole find, fix, track, target, engage cycle. So one sensor finding something out there doesn't mean it was necessarily ID'd. And this is where some games will use the mechanism of block games where you know, the block starts off face down that, or, or in so, turned in such a way that only the owner knows what it is, but the other guy at least knows that there's something there. And then with perhaps some more sensors or another, uh, another successful roll of die, now it goes from being an unknown surface, com uh, surface contact to at least now I've identified that it's a combatant and not a commercial or merchant ship. And then maybe another level is needed to go, ah, it's not only a combatant, it's a destroyer, and now I have enough to put a weapon on it. Those are all things you can think about in this context of how do you link the two together. But again, are those sensors that are being used to support that subject to enemy fire? Do you need rules about 
how can I take down the satellite? What's the satellite susceptible to in this game? Um, that, or is it a freebie that's just always hovering uh, it's geostationary over the battle space, constantly feeding target information. If you create a rule set that says that I have a perpetual sensor system that can't be influenced or affected, well, then why do you even have it in the game? Just make it open intelligence, okay? You don't even have, need to have it if you can't make decisions about it or otherwise manipulate it, and that means you need to have written rule sets that integrate it with the rest of play. Probably one of the hardest things from a board gaming perspective in many ways to, to introduce are the are command and control concepts. Because most board games suffer from what we call the God, in the, the God in, the, in the sky problem. There you are hovering over your game board, loose, looking down at it. Okay? And there's, very, uh, there's, a great, uh, there's a high unlikelihood that the piece you want to move isn't going to move or go to the right place. Because your hand's going to reach down out of Olympus. You're going to take that piece and you're going to move it from this polygon to that polygon. And it always goes where you want it to go. You've got perfect control. Well, how do we emulate the fog and friction of real war, though? So then we start thinking about coming up with rule sets that somehow represent the flow of orders. Do you have to be able to draw a line of communication to some sort of headquarter tent? Um, how do we start to represent that command and control portion? Uh, this is a little easier to do in computer-driven games because you can start to influence the flow of information between computers and between game cells to start to represent this. Um, this also then feeds back into how does Intel link to the command piece that we just put in. And often this is the sense of SA in terms of what is intelligence feeding back to headquarter elements that helps them understand their battle space. In fact, open and closed intelligence and rule sets. Okay, can I take fires onto those C2 systems such that I can either non-kinetically, cyber fires, can I use cyber fires to disrupt your command and control system that'll have a meaningful impact on the rest of the pieces on the board? Rule set you need to incorporate. And is there any logistics capacity that somehow you want to try to fold that somehow logistics enables the C2? Okay, um, if you're playing an old, uh, you're playing a Civil War game and you want to think about running tele the telegraph wire. Okay, well, you physically need to have the wire to run. Okay, and that's a logistics issue about getting the wire from point A to point B and being able to establish the command and control systems. So this whole, this whole pyramid and rule set um, is designed such that, that as you look at these relationships, and if it's a military problem, we like to all fall back on either operational functions or time, space, and force, all right, as the things that make us think about how we see the battle space and how we consider how one affects the other. You say a lot of these can be force effects in terms of you know, I can have a force effect on movement, meaning that, hey, this type of vehicle moves slower than that type of vehicle. It's just the nature of the vehicle. There can be a space effect on the force. Okay, if we're thinking about space effects on movement, that's simply the fact that I can't go through rough terrain as fast as I can go down a road. Do you need to have that type of differentiation? I play strategic games where we don't care. Okay, the force is in Germany. It's going to go from the middle of Germany, and I'm going to move the force to, the, to its border with Poland. I'm not, I don't care how it got there. I'll assume it got there in the most expeditious manner. And I'm not going to sit there and worry about, did it go down the road? Did it have to march through the woods? Because it's beyond scale and scope of the game. I often think this little shape, by the way, my little, this little pyramid would make an awesome uh, secret society logo. And, and Robert, we, we joke about, you know, puck pushing and, and stuff to put on mugs. Um, this is my super secret adjudication symbology. So another way to then to think about it as you lay these things out uh, is create this kind of matrix type of thing where I do this, uh, especially for games that are gonna be very, very tactical potentially um, using individual pucks that represent individual forces. Um, and you kind of lay out this grid to try to understand uh, and capture the, those relationships I was just describing in the pyramid, okay? So the ones down the center here, these just represent the thing, the, the most basic rule you have about it, whatever it is, okay? Your most basic movement rule, for example, okay? And remember I said that almost all games kind of the, the simplest rule sets and maybe all you need lives up here in my green zone. It's just the movement and fires rules. But as you start to add out and you get out into adding log and Intel rule sets, these typically get a little more difficult to incorporate and how you think about the answer to these intersections, okay? And, and I've kind of thrown out some questions as potential ways to think about those intersections. And then you have to answer those in the context of time, space, and force. And finally, like I said, C2, because it's sometimes some of the hardest to add to a game, um, particularly in board gaming environments. But uh, if you're doing something which is much more cell-based with close intelligence, the players are physically separated, potentially distributed, then this is uh, easier to implement. But it, it should, you should uh, still think hard about it, all right? So again, that things are conducted in, uh, in meaningful ways to play.
Right? So as I said, all of these attributes somehow have to fit into some sort of ways, means, ends framework that the player sees as useful in getting them to the victory conditions. Here's my example. Um, Battle of Mobile Bay, a Civil War game, obviously, 1864, uh, that I designed, and I specifically wanted to do two things. This game was designed for use in the classroom, and so we needed to be able to address the ironclads and, and Farragut and, and Mobile Bay and, it's, and that significance. But also it was meant to be a naval engineering trade-off game, meaning the players actually got to make decisions about how many guns they're gonna put on their ironclad, whether it was gonna be turret or casement designed, um, how much armor, boilers, uh, now, what prevents them just from piling on everything? Well, just I want as many guns as I can get and as much armor as I can get and as big of boilers so I can go as fast as I can go. Well, you know from a naval engineering perspective that there's a weight problem <laughs> being introduced here, right? This thing's going to have a wicked deep draft, this thing you're building. And there's a feature in the environment with Mobile Bay and the fact that it's a very shallow bay and there's a channel that's, that's, that was dredged out. So now... These decisions about offense and defense are tying into the draft of the vessel or tying into the operational environment. So the way I thought about this, and I went and I did my homework, I got a couple of books on my bookshelves about ironclad engineering and development at the time and Ericsson and, uh, and how, this, how, the, how this whole kind of thing played out historically. And so I decided that for the purposes of this game, that the design choices that the kids were gonna make were gonna be around the number of guns, how much armor they wanted, and how many boilers they were gonna get on there, okay? And those then had other effects. They then caused a dependency. So the number of boilers was connected to then how fast you went. More boilers, more steam, more steam, more speed. Oversimplification, but that's the way we set it for the game, okay? But boilers weigh, okay? they come with weight. They themselves have a weight problem, so they're gonna to add to my, dis my displacement problem. The guns add to my displacement problem. But guns and the opportunity to penetrate my adversary's armor and the trade-off of my own weight between armor and guns is gonna be a problem I'm gonna to have to wrestle with. And clearly I'm gonna need guns to go engage the other guy. And if the object of the game is to go sink as many of the other guys as I can, then I'm gonna to need to bring, out the more guns I bring to the party, uh, the more likely I am to win in this time period, okay? And obviously the more better armored I show up, the less likely it is that I will be removed. Now, the game also had mines. Mines were a problem, because mines go to draft, draft goes to displacement. As I already mentioned, there was a shallow bay. And this was a problem in terms of where I get to operate. Lastly, we had this piece of forts, all right? There are two forts that guard the entrance to Mobile Bay. And the idea is to get past them and out of their gun range as fast as you can. So speed becomes an, an element there. But again, the gun, the forts have guns and you wanna get into a gun battle with the fort and what's the relationship between the ironclad shooting at the fort and the fort shooting at the ironclads. So you can see how, this is how I started to, to lash these three categories of things together the stuff that I wanted the players to have immediate decisions over, how it then had a knock-on effect on something else, and an environmental piece that they had to consider in making their choices. So I don't care whether you call this, you know, attribute linking or, or the link cause analysis or you know, whatever, um, much of your game design is gonna boil down into some sort of relationship mapping, right? This is another example from a, a game we had. It was a, a Paul Mill game called Grab Granite Island. And uh, every it was a, a faux geography. We had uh, these countries, Yellowtopia, Brownistan, People's Republic of Purple. Uh, and the players had direct control over a handful of things. They had direct control over refineries, uh, farms, and steel mills in terms of resources. And then they had their money supply. And we created all these secondary effects in terms of, uh, it's not just about having oil, to prepare, you know, oil to put into your war machine, um, grain to feed your soldiers, and steel to make the instruments of war out of, uh, there's a civilian populace you have to worry about. Now, how do I make them care though? This is always a problem. How do you make them care about the civilians? Well, we came up with rule sets and we said that in this case, your oil supply, the oil not going into your military machine is oil that's available for domestic consumption. And the le more in the military machine means the less available for the public, which means gas prices go up. Same principle between food going to feed the army versus food going to feed your people drove a poverty index. And we just came up with some faux math behind this. Go back to my marvelous math machine, by the way. This is the same kind of thing. Okay. And steel represented the raw materials, not just to make tanks, but to make toasters. 
So if I was diverting everything into my military side, that meant that I was shuttering toaster factories. And again, I'd have an unemployment problem. These are all linked to an inflation value, which is in turn linked to a public approval. But so why do people care? Right here's why they care. Public approval drove to tax base. Unhappy people wouldn't pay taxes. That's the rule we had, okay? And the players desperately needed money to continue to fund their operations uh, in order to keep moving towards the victory condition. So now they suddenly cared about a balance between domestic and military spending. Guns and butter became a problem uh, in this game. And this is how we mapped it out. And this is how we made it work by having this little relationship tree. So second half now, I wanna briefly touch on the kind of the scenario context. And when we say scenario, different things come to people's, into people's heads. Um, it's really about the broader context of the quote situation that you're injecting your player into. Now, in some cases, people tend to separate just the, on the, uh, uh, from a board game perspective that the scenario tends to be more about the, the map because it represents the where and the pieces and the pucks are just that. So I've got pieces that represent the capabilities. I've got some, that's the what. And the kind of the where is the map the when is whatever I tell you. It's 1942, it's 2042, okay? And then the why is based on the objective I've given you to go solve a problem that the game represents. So yeah, it's somewhat analogous to the board, but not completely, all right? So let's talk a little bit about like this, in my world, um, this scenario continuum, okay? Because some people ask like, well, do you always use just real world situations or do you make stuff up? I go, well, it all depends on who I'm doing it for. Okay. So this is where we got this, this vernacular that we use, and this idea of at one end of the spectrum, we'll have what I call the non-fiction, the non-fiction uh, scenarios. Now, I only call them non-fiction because it's the agreed upon truth. It's defense planning scenarios or the national planning scenarios tend to be Situate, you know, these are scenarios that for the purposes of trying to do an apples to apples comparison as different uh, people use different scenarios as they relate to uh, North Korea, Iran, uh, China, right? That we've got this agreed set of parameters that represent China in 2030 or represent Iran in 2030. If Iran has uh, lots of oil sales, lots of revenue, um, and they are on a more uh, belligerent uh, path, what do they look like versus uh, they have less cash on hand? What do they look like? Those are all real stats are inside of the defense planning scenarios. But everyone kind of agrees that yes, for the purposes of defense planning, defense acquisition, this is the way we've collectively agreed to see country X. But then as you start to slide down my scale, okay, then we get into what I call the historical fiction zone. And that's where I'm probably still using real geography, but I'm not adhering necessarily to the to the, uh, the factors or conditions that are in the DPSs, right? Maybe I wanna have it better or worse. Maybe I've created my own fiction about how, uh, for the purposes of gameplay, I want a better relationship than the DPS is painting for Iran with her or her neighbors or whatever, okay? But this is where we just started taking real geography and coming up with fictitious. Sometimes we rotate the planet. You know, it's like, okay, we're gonna use the geography of the Balkans, but we're gonna turn it 90 degrees and make it, uh, everything else is going to be the same, but for some reason, we just want to help people to kind of break up their thinking, um, and we're going to orient it uh, east, west, instead of north, south. Uh, but you're using real geography, fictitious settings. As you keep sliding down this the scale, okay, and oh, by the way, uh, an example, a good example are con-up scenarios, okay, where often as we want to look at uh, a potentially useful, uh, some sort of concept of operations, um, we may need to create different scenarios, multiple scenarios around a given country, or multiple scenarios across the globe to see the efficacy of this con op in a global problem or in multiple different types of theaters. Um, and then you can start getting that sliding down to the fantasy zone. Now, right away here, notice I got one here called the JML Capstone Scenario. This is at the Gore College, the Joint Maritime Ops uh, Curriculum. Um, we do a, a, a war game for the students. It's set in Borneo. So in some ways it's historical fiction because I'm using the real island of Borneo and Indonesia and Malaysia, that, that region, Java Sea. Um, but we've created a new fiction about uh, a particular uh, faction that rises to power, an independence movement, um, some breakaway republics, a relationship with PRC that doesn't currently exist, but it creates the situation that we wanna put the students in to think through some specific learning outcomes. The, then at the bottom here, I've got my Granite Island, I mentioned earlier, Granite, uh, um, 
Yellowtopia, People's Republic of Purple, uh, that type of thing. Um, we have another place, uh, and the fantasy ones are these these totally made up places. Okay, uh, we have one that we use for a series of games called um, Bartland, uh, because the lead designer on the problem, uh, his nickname was Bart. So Bartland, um, and they were colored countries. Uh, we had uh, one uh, that we called the beach ball. And it was simply the world looked like a multicolored beach ball uh, where we just had created uh, multiple zones across it like a colored beach ball, um, just to kind of represent notional uh, unified command plan AORs. But we wanted, didn't want to get into, well, is it UCOM or is it PACOM? It's like, no, it's the purple stripe, the orange stripe, the green stripe, and the yellow stripe. And, and that's is sufficient. And here's the sorts of problems that happen in the yellow stripe. Uh, here's the sorts of problems that happen in the blue stripe, et cetera. Now, um, so what, what's the difference? Which one should you use? Well, it depends on your, depends on your objective and it depends on your audience, right? I had this conversation with uh, N35 at the, at the Pentagon years ago, and we said, hey, what do you think about this? And my answer from 3.5 was, if you can help me better understand future force uh, structure, and you tell me that the best way to get at that problem is to have us fight the Martians, then we'll fight the Martians. If it yields insight into future force structure, then he pauses. But you can't get N81 to fund anything to do with fighting the Martians. They only wanna to respond to defense planning scenarios. They wanna to respond to things which are far more concrete and tied to national security objectives based on future threat environments. Um, and the likelihood that we're fighting the Martians is pretty slim because I get it. I see how fighting the Martians potentially could force us to think about the fleet in a different way. And I'm, I'm happy to do that, but you need to understand the difference of uh, gaming for N35 and gaming for N81 or N8, okay? So again, it depends, uh, what you need to get out of it. And this leads us then to this idea of what's called a front end scenario versus a back end scenario. So front end scenarios like my locomotive are pulling the rest of the game. It means that the, the, the place you need to be, the situation you need to be is a given. It's if we are in this situation, then if that's what I wanna understand, how do you design or create a game that gets me to pick at that? So most games where we wanna fight a specific adversary in his neighborhood or in some part of the globe tend to be front end problems because that's a given, okay? We're gonna, if we're gonna talk about war with PRC, we tend to talk about it in the context of that's the country we're gonna fight, the PRC, not Red, not Redistan, it's gonna be the PRC and we're gonna do it in the Western Pacific unless we think we're doing it at a period when the PRC and the, the PLAN has a greater uh, overseas naval presence, and we actually want to look at what this problem looks like in the Indian Ocean if it's an away game for them and an away game for us. Okay, but you're giving all that up front in terms of this is what I'm trying to understand as the sponsor. You're giving that at the front. Now, that's different than what we call the back end scenarios. Back end scenarios are typically more appropriate for when you've got ideas that you want to flesh out. Air sea battle back in the day. All right, was one of those things where, or sea control, and this specific example I'll show you here in a second, where these were situations where we didn't necessarily have their place in mind. We had an idea, a way of fighting in mind and wanted to better understand that way of fighting. So in that case then, the designer says, well, if that's the sort of thing you need to understand, if these are the sorts of things that that uh, type of concept is meant to address, then let's create a world where these are the problems and see how it, how it works. In that case, your scenario is an outcome, just like your decisions about what pucks to put in, the decisions about what players to bring to the game, and the decisions about who to have play is all back in. Now, I tend to make, you know, I tend to, to create categories for things that you're either this or that, understanding that these are using some sort of sliding scale and there's usually an awful lot of overlap, okay? So just from over the years at the college, you can see that some of our games have fallen into kind of this front end stuff, especially like alternative future games, where you're saying, if this, if this is the future, this is a world where, in a world where, right, we've got resource rivalry and, and uh, water scarcity and high militancy, then what do we do? Well, those are all givens in the front end of the problem, okay? As opposed to, um, I've got an idea about how to fight against, like sea control problems, 
then maybe I want to explore those agnostic to a specific place to better understand how the idea might work in multiple places. So I create this faux world that has all sorts of different pieces, parts of attributes to it that'll get me to pick at uh, the, the core principles of the idea I'm trying to investigate. So it tends to be a backend problem, Granite Island. Anytime we use these pretend worlds, usually the pretend worlds are the output of a design decision that I need a world where. And that's why I, get, I plug it in. So examples, front end scenarios, as I mentioned, um, you know, all the war planning in the interwar period tended to be kind of very front endy. Okay, in terms of if we go to war with Japan, if we go to war with Germany, if we go to war with Great Britain, um, if we go to war with anybody, and this is the kit they bring to the fight, and this is where we are, then what? Okay, um, Royal Dutch Shell uh, famously did a lot of, of the scenario base. You use your scenario based planning. We talked about that idea. You're saying if this is the scenario, then what? Okay, so if in the future oil prices drop significantly instead of continuing to rise as they had historically, then how do sound is our, uh, our plan. But those are all front end scenario type things. Back end scenarios, um, and your examples in the global war gaming we did in 2009, 2011, it tend to be very sea control focused. So we spent a lot of time breaking down what does sea control mean? Um, and, but because of some other constraints, we had to live at the DPS end of the scale. So how did then we merge those two? And I'll show you here in a second, how we kind of used the DPSs to ultimately be to service what was a back end problem. Um, and again, as I said, you can always go fictitious, right? And create your own worlds. And that's what we did for uh, our Granite Island elective gaming, uh, for Paul Mill gaming. That's what we did for some work we did again around air sea battle in 2013 and 2014, completely, completely made up worlds, okay? Um, now, I, I wanna go back to this thing about Global Nine though and the sea control piece. So, just like I showed you earlier, in terms of breaking stuff down, what does that mean? What's related and connected to it? Sea control. We went there and said, okay, th that's nice to say, what does it mean? So we went to our literature review, we went to our direct publications, we dug through naval literature, and we looked at the understanding of sea control. And we found that there were these seven key attributes that were discussed in doctrine and this idea is about scale of sea control, the duration of sea control, force factor, et cetera. You can see them here. And even those had sub factors. And we got into the whole, well, we can't make a world where we're gonna look at sea control for everything. I can't, it's very difficult to play a game where I'm looking at strategic sea control and tactical sea control, for example. So we picked operational sea control, <laughs> it went down the middle, right? And we did that for all of these. We looked at what the sponsor wanted to try to understand we looked at the concept, we looked at the idea of sea control, and the check marks are the ones we said, these are the ones I think we need to go after to create a sea control problem that will be relevant for the concept under investigation. So now that I have those picked out, I had to say, okay, and they wanna use a DPS. Well, which one? Which of the defense planning scenarios has most of those attributes or are or, or, or all those attributes equally important? or are some more important than others? How do we do that? So we looked at the, at the time, the 10 defense planning scenarios and all told them between them and what, everything they wanted to look at between sea basing and sea control and joint combat operations. There's 57 different things that were in play across 10 defense planning scenarios. So the very first thing is did was we all sat there and started reading them with a checklist in hand and pretty rapidly six fell away as just being, I didn't care how we racked and stacked them, the six weren't gonna play. So that left us with four defense planning scenarios going forward. Then, but again, 57 doctrinal attributes or aspects, that's too many. So at the uh, concept development conference, we brought this up and we got those 57 shrunk down to 37, all right? And those 37, then we went in a separate development pathway that says, yeah, but are all those equally important? And how do we look at those? And we looked at those and we got those down to 25. Uh, in one round and down to nine, and I guess, okay, now nine's, nine's a workable number. We're down to nine by the time we get down to round two. And then we used a process called analytic hierarchy process, which uh, remember I said, are all attributes the same? Are they all equally weighted? Well, the answer is no. It turns out that some are, some aren't. So we went through that process and now we had a solid set of nine criteria that had been, uh, had been uh, weighted that I could then evaluate these four and these four, when these four were put against 37, only two survived. So these last two DPSs were evaluated against the nine criteria that came out of this process. And in the end, one scenario clearly looked like it had what we needed. Why did we go through all this pain? And here's just one of the early score sheets where we went through and we were just stuck. I mean, it was pretty, pretty gross scoring. It was either that feature 
Um, the, the A's across the top are to represent uh, the defensive planning scenarios, obviously keep this unclassed. Down the left side were all the sorts of things we were looking for. And uh, if it got a zero is if we didn't see significant play for that thing and that particular DPS to, yeah, one, maybe two. Oh no, two, yeah, twos are good, all right? Color coded it so we can rapidly see the winners and losers. And you can see things like G, G got, got thrown out pretty early, all right? But I went through all this process because ultimately when we picked the scenario we did, we got pushback. There were people who didn't live in, the, in that, that part of the world with that, that adversary um, and wanted us to use their world for this evaluation. But because we were able to go back and say, yes, we hear you, but if this is what the concept is about, if this is what is important, then here is the scenario we ought to use for these reasons. And we, we you know, carried today in that case. Um, so like I said earlier, backend scenarios aren't that much different than every other design decision you have to make in terms of if I want to get at this objective, I want to have these people, I want to have this kit in the game, I need to have this sort of environment, um, I need this particular bad guy in this particular context. And you'll always be able to say, and here's why that's important. Now, but your sponsors often come at a scenario where they come at your problem with a scenario in mind. They start with the scenario. <laughs> Most designers rather end with the scenario. After I put everything else together, then I'll build the context for it, okay? And it, it, makes, it makes perfect sense if you think about how we go about our worlds and how we see the world. And this is very much true from a board game design perspective, right? So when you're a consumer of a board game, you're walking down the aisle at Walmart, you're looking for a game for your, your nephew's birthday gift, and you're looking at the shelf and you're pulling boxes down and you're starting your evaluation was what the game designer ended with, a game in a box. So you're looking at that box and you're trying to look at it and decide if it's appropriate for his age, if it looks like the subject matter he'd be interested in, um, how many players does it have, how long does it play, oh, how much does it cost? You're doing all those evaluations uh, based on what you have in your hands, the end product of the design process. That is not how the designer started. The designer said, I want, a group of players to have an experience. And the experience I want them to have is I want them to, to imagine they're a commander of this, they're in charge of that, they're, they're elves in the forest, they're trying to find their way to millionaire acres. I, there's an experience the designer wants you to have. And he creates a game and creates play and creates pieces and rules and environments and scenario that when you unpack it, you'll have that experience. Designers start with the experience, they start with the objective, and they end with the scenario. Consumers tend to start with the scenario, go through gameplay to arrive at the objective. They do work the other way around. And it, it's just, it, that's not right or wrong. It's just, that's just the nature of where we are. <laughs> the two of us live in, our, in these worlds. So what you have to be able to explain to a, a sponsor is that they may come forward with a scenario as part of their problem, and it's not necessarily the best one. And you've got to be able to explain that and show them why. Now, the last thing here I want to touch on, or next to last thing, is this idea called the realism challenge, right? And it's a trap. Right? As soon as someone comes into you and says that, hey, we want to add some stuff to the scenario to make it more real. What are they really saying? Because adding more bits to your model, go back to my modeling lecture, right? We don't fix models by, making them in, by increasing the complexity of it. Okay, so usually what's buried in that, those words, it would be more realistic, is that uh, a couple of things are at intention. And one of them is if you come from an MNS background, right, oftentimes, and not throwing the MNS community under the bus, it's just not, it's not my world. I tend to be a bit more abstract than the MNS side. Um, it's this idea that the only reason you're excluding stuff from your game, the only reason you have to do abstraction is that we, we haven't been able to provide you a good enough model to simulate it for your game. And it's this idea that by adding pieces parts, I improve the quote realism of the scenario and thereby improve the relevancy. That's really what they mean, okay? Go back to our earlier lecture that all war games either provide a decision-making experience or decision-making information that has to be relevant to real world situations. And how do I get that relevancy? Well, often the simplistic way to think about the relevancy is to quote, make it real. And our argument has always been from a gameplay perspective is that if that's what you need, go exercise, go get the guys, 
lumber them up, go wander into the National Training Center, and go shoot each other and play laser tag. If you need to get real, short of hurting people, all right, then go exercise. If on the other hand, you're trying to understand wickedly complex scenarios and situations where you're, what, what you've been, or whatever you've been doing to date hasn't worked, because you've come to me asking me for a war game to quote solve a problem, uh, and apparently your day job, which is as real as it gets, isn't solving the problem, then we're purposely creating abstract areas to force you to focus on things you may not have otherwise focused on to shed maybe some understanding or to find some enlightenment that otherwise we haven't found. The abstraction and the reduction of realism, quote unquote, is a feature to a game designer, not a bug that needs to be compensated for by adding more MS or adding more complexity to the game. An example I often use, my wife is an attorney, um, and this is from law school, okay? This is a, from the flag in the background there. Um, this looks like someplace in the state of, uh, what's that, uh, Colorado. Um, this is moot court. Now, as soon as I brought up this picture, I'm sure many of you looked at it and went, oh, it's a courtroom, All right? You immediately saw enough visual cues here that either from your own experience or just watching a you know, crime drama on television, you knew that that was a courtroom. But the more you look at it, the more you'll see that there's some pieces, parts missing, okay? Um, you'll notice that there's no, uh, everyone's counsel here. It's all uh, counsel for the defense, and counsel for the plaintiff, and there's no defendant. Yeah, because for moot court, what's the, port of, what's the point of moot court? For law students to get practice arguing in court. So having somebody sit there, think of what a defendant does in a case, right? You've gotta be there, you have a constitutional right to be there as part of, the, of your prosecution, right? But by and large, you don't participate, you, all right? You do everything through your attorney. So to have another person sitting there, moot, I might as well bring in a mannequin right? There would be no value added to injecting a defendant sitting in a chair. This, in this case, they're learning to argue in front of a bench trial, so there's no jury. But also that was missing is the bailiff. And the bailiff is a wonderful example of unnecessary detail, but, okay, so this would be more realistic if there was a bailiff in the room. And there isn't. There's no bailiffs in these things, right? I know we're going to hire a security officer to be a bailiff from moot court. Why? Dumb. Now, but that's the same argument people will make. So, well, you know, a bailiff would make it more realistic. But that's not the objective. The objective isn't to create a holodeck. The objective is to create a learning environment for these law students. Now, if the objective was to expose the students to some of the security challenges and nightmares that have unfolded in courtrooms when defendants have grabbed a firearm from the bailiff, when someone has smuggled a weapon into the gallery and you wanna see what that, how that plays out, then a bailiff is crucially important to understanding this scenario. But if I don't need them, I'm not gonna put them in here. Moot court, your war game scenario, same situation. Pick the parts you need, leave everything else off. Now, with that, I want to say a little bit about Road to Crisis. This is, this is the last piece here, because Road to Crisis is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, okay? Road to Crisis or Road to Conflict or Road to War or whatever it is you're trying to call it, all right? These are often way too long, in my opinion, okay? Because they try to take the situation where if we're going to have a scenario where we are fighting uh, Iran in 2030, and it's currently 2020, I need to tell a story how over the last decade we got to armed conflict with Iran. D do you? you? Do you need to tell me this story? Movies use road to conflicts all the time because especially science fiction movies, let's think about it. In a science fiction movie, as, as, the, as the member of the audience, you're being asked to join into this world and to watch a story unfold in some alien world. It's either alien because it's in the future or it's alien because it's on a distant planet. So how do movie theaters or how do uh, production companies, how do directors, how do they do their road to crisis? See if you can figure out which movie this is from. Because this is the road to crisis. This is the this is the storytelling to get you into the movie. Okay. 
Okay, if you haven't guessed by now, you should guess. This is Blade Runner, the original. Okay, that gave you everything you need to know about the next two hours you're about to see on the screen. Okay, right there. That gave you everything. I understand when we are, I understand where we are, I understand the situation that the characters in this movie are in, okay? There's other ones now that you start to think about it, right? Pretty famous one, okay? And you know what's about to follow? The long scrolling story, chapter nine. When last we left our, you know, courageous, blah, blah, blah. and all of these are a takeoff. The Star Wars uh, a Crawler, it's called, is an intentional takeoff of movies of the 1930s where they were episodic. So these are the Buck Rogers, right, where you had to catch the Buck from the last time we saw Buck. He was hanging off the side of a cliff. How did he get there? Okay. So we have to provide that context. Right. This is another one. Okay. This one's from Terminator. We've got to explain how we ended up in this, this world where we've got machines in charge, all right? And that's it. Now, these are tight and quick. Why? Because movies are about money. So I'm, why, the, why these sorts of things are popular is that they're wicked cheap because it's just text, okay? And I don't need to necessarily film a lot of other stuff, other bits to explain this situation, okay? I don't, it, it's very easy to do at the end of production is to come up with this little thing that sets the stage for your players. And this is where you often hear people say, well, I need to do this road to crisis to get the players to push the I believe button. And my, my cynical view is if you have to go to extraordinary lengths to get your players to understand the scenario and to see value in playing, you've got the wrong players. Nobody has to go and twist my arm to get me to engage in a board game. I will engage and understand, but it's a relatively low bar to get me, in, get, to get me involved, right? Because I like play. I get it. I, and I'm willing to rapidly join what we call the, the magic circle, the golden circle of storytelling that games represent. So your challenge when you write these road to crises or you try to set up these background stories is that you want to provide the minimum relevant information that's going to allow the players to orient themselves to the game, be it oriented in time, in place, who they represent, and what they're trying to accomplish. Full stop. Okay? You don't need to take them. You pick up a World War II game, uh, or here, actually, this is my favorite one. This is from the interwar period, okay? This is all that the student at the War College would get in, say, 1930. Okay, and it's just that relations between blue and red have deteriorated to the point that armed conflict is imminent and the Red Fleet has sailed. There, that's it. Because for the students, they didn't need to have a long backstory for why we were mad at red or black or silver or whatever color we were fighting today. It's, it didn't matter to those students trying to learn how to tactically place their fleets at naval advantage. So there was no point in telling them long stories about how, how diplomacy had collapsed. Okay, this is from a board game, Axis and Allies. Okay, it's a World War II game. And in this case, it's the Guadalcanal game that I like so much that I often use in these examples. But it's August of 42, Japan's occupied the chain. All right, the goals of that occupation to protect her flank. All right, offensive New Guinea, see here. The United States is to begin its counterattack with a surprise landing in Guadalcanal. That's it, done. Okay, I'm not gonna go back to the end of World War I. I'm not gonna go back to the iron and steel embargo that the United States imposed. I'm not gonna go back to the decay of relationships between Japan and the United States. I'm not gonna go back and highlight, oh, and in 41, they attacked Pearl Harbor because that's all useless information for a player of this particular game, okay? So you just give them the minimum they need to engage with the material, right? And this idea that realism is good is as well I'll end with this that well reality is the worst game ever okay i have far more control over the artificial worlds that i can create for you to create engaging decision making play than try to spend my time trying to make your scenario quote as real as possible when what you really need is a relevant scenario 
to get you to explore ideas, to get you to think about decisioning, to get you to think through consequences. And that's what your pucks and your scenario have to do together. These are the things the players manipulate, okay? Because they are, are, they aren't directly messing with each other, okay? My red cell and my blue cell aren't actually coming to fisticuffs out in the hallway. They're doing it through proxies. And their proxies are the game pieces that represent their military forces. And the, and the con context under which those military forces are fighting is a scenario that I have created, an artificial world that I have created where they're trying to learn, okay? So that, is our discussion of pucks and maps. And I didn't get into like, should your map have hexes or should it have grids? Uh, that, that's a discussion we can have. There's some guides on, or should it be polygons or should it be no, you know, just open, use a ruler like Warhammer uh, on the tabletop. Um, uh, aggregation and disaggregation. Oh, should you ought to be able to stack up your pucks or what if the player wants to break his puck into smaller pucks? These are all things you're gonna have to wrestle with. But I think more importantly is you need to get the big pieces right in terms of understanding what pucks you ought to have, period. And that your pucks weren't just thrown in the game because someone said that you really ought to have LSTs in the game. Uh, and you haven't figured out how they have any relationship to anything else in the game. Okay, get all of that right. And then you can start arguing about, you know, minimum distances that the map will represent, um, minimum ranges and maximum ranges, um, strength points. This often comes up, well, should a carrier be seven? Or a lot of times what you do is you pick the thing that you think is the hardest to kill, you make it a 10, right? And you make everything less than that, okay? It can be that simple. But then you've got to go and rigorously check those rules to make sure they make sense then in terms of I gave it a defensive power of 10, but everything else I gave a firepower of eight. Oh, good grief. That just means that two things pummel it. Well, that, that's not right. Eight's too high. You'll have to play with those sorts of things when you're trying to make abstract rules like that, that you're trying to rely on rigid rule sets to represent the orders of battle. And even when you're not using rigid rule sets, even when you're trying to go to subject matter expertise, you ought to have already thought through what happens when the player says, when your subject matter expert says, yes, that gets hit. Okay, then what does that mean for the rest of the game in a way which is coherent and consistent and everybody understands? Robert, what are we doing? Are we doing questions? Sure, you, everyone should be able to unmute and, and ask a question. Stunned silence. Um, I've got a comment, not necessarily a question, since no one else is saying anything. Go Sorry, it's uh, um, Pete. It's uh, Major Scott Roach here from the Canadian Forces Warfare Centre. Uh, I run the wargaming section um, for the CAF here. Uh, we saw support our Joint Ops Command. Um, I see uh, Ben Taylor from uh, DRDC in Canada as well, and Ben and I have worked together on a number of. Uh, activities in the past. Um, first, let me say thank you very much. That was the best and I wish I could now take your presentation and put it in front of my chain of command and say, stop telling me what you want your scenario to look like. Um, so this is actually very good. And uh, for me, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm new to wargaming. Um, I've only been in the job about 18 months and I still consider that very, very new. Um, thank you, COVID. You stopped me from going to uh, the Naval War College and doing your two-week uh, wargaming course this oh. year too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you instruct on that, Pete? That's uh, That was what I wanted to talk about. Do you instruct on that course? I hope so. I do. I do. Then yeah. I, I look if forward to being it. able to do it in the future. Yeah, yeah. you can get to it because in that, we give you a lot of hands-on. Right? Our, our, yes. uh, both the, um, the January and June course, um, what we try to do is like the mornings are theory, in the afternoons or do it kind of thing. So we kind of had you working on a game and, and wrestle with all this stuff. And we do a lot more case study and hands-on stuff that just doesn't particularly work well, obviously. But yes, if you can get to the course, definitely. Excellent. And I think for me, uh, being Australian background, I think uh, Rhode Island in June sounds more pleasurable than Rhode Island in January. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, uh, we joke about how we, uh, we have uh, no problem getting people to come to war game in the summer. But boy, try to get someone to show up at our war games in February. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Peter. Yep. Yeah. So I think this is uh, Ben Taylor, the other, the other Canadian who's also not a Canadian, originally, originally British, but I've been Canadian for the last decade or more. 
Uh, oh, the Commonwealth. We have the Commonwealth going. That, that's right. We, we just sort of shuffle ourselves around, we deal in a new hand, and the accents just move around. Um, <laughs> so, um, again, as an observation uh, and an add on rather than a question per se, um, like very much the way you had done that uh, breakdown of the, of the uh, planning scenarios to select one you needed from the questions that you had. Uh, we actually did the sort of similar thing back the other way when we designed our set of planning scenarios. We took the uh, we took the key drivers from the defense strategy, uh, then did a morphological analysis to work out what kind of combinations of things are more likely to happen. You know, would Canada be more likely to be leading an operation, which is a global one? The answer, no. Uh, would Canada be likely to be leading an operation taking place in Canada? Yes. Um, and then you can crunch the numbers and it says, well, these are the most likely combinations of features your scenarios might have. And here's the minimum number of scenarios you need to cover off all of those things. And here's the blueprint of your scenario set, none of which has any real geography because you've just said what happens and what kind of people are involved. You can then yeah. go um, hunting the history books or hunting your, your world atlas and say, well, it could be, it could happen here. Um, and let's write it around that. So moving down your sort of your slide towards the real geography fictional events um, that you've created the scenario fit. So I just thought that would just be perhaps interesting for the group to so say you can drive it the other way around. You can start from the strategy and derive the kind of scenario you need to test it um, yeah. and go from there. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll echo Scott's comments that um, that's a, a great presentation brings a lot of very important things together in a very succinct fashion. Um, and if you do need to attract people to play war games in Rhode Island in January or February, you just have to say the alternative course has been run in Ottawa. <laughs> then they'll come flooding to Rhode Island. Well, that's, we joke about uh, connections north, you know, uh, that your ex-writer runs up uh, and then go, really? January? Montreal? Really? <laughs> it's a great experience. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much again. Certainly. Actually, Pete, it's in February, so it's much better. Oh, it's February. Oh, yeah, so much. It's much more better. That's right. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, much better. <laughs> Anything else? So, as we said before, this will end up on uh, up on uh, tabletophistory.net, um, and uh, as will the the PDF and all the all the other ones. We finally kind of got everything together into one spot. Um, so you can grab both the videos from there uh, as well as the, um, the PDF files. And if you're looking for stuff from the um, mods and sims discussion we had and modeling inside of Wargaming, those Excel mini mouse uh, are also on the, the, the .NET site. Uh, Pete, I was wondering about um, with scenarios and sponsors, uh, it seems like it's also used as a communication tool or a marketing summary. In other words, uh, the this the sponsor can kind of capture a scenario in a few a couple sentences and and don't have to get so involved in the details of it in order to communicate what's going on mm -hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit more about that um, and and how you either have to deal with that or or maybe uh, guide them in that process um so oftentimes yeah when people want to talk about the game you talk about in the context of uh the scenario all right um, and that's fine. Um, the trick is, but again, that should be the on the back side of things in terms of as you think about okay, post game analysis, post game reporting, and how you describe the situation that the players were in. Um, to again, just like so, so now even my my movie analogy is even more relevant, right? Because uh, the the movie, the game has been played, the players played their part. There was a fight, winners and losers. Right. So now I'm coming at it as the reader of this report and I need to understand enough to, that I can now have the rest of the story make sense. Um, but again, that can be pretty, sh you know, pretty short. Right. Uh, and we often have this, we get into this argument, uh, argument, we get into this brisk discussion with uh, some of our, our sponsors and, and other agencies who want to use our wargaming for their decision making purposes. Uh, and we'll kind of get into this drill. We'll say, well, your scenario wasn't realistic. And usually you say, well, hang on. <laughs> First of all, as soon as they say your 2030 scenario wasn't realistic, I go, really? You, you know what our record is for getting the future right, <laughs> especially when it's more than a decade out. It's not great. Right. So 
our, our rejoinder is always, given the situation scenario that the players found themselves in, these are the sorts of decisions they made with the kit they had to accomplish the, the ends they were asked to, to achieve. Now, we can argue that if the situation were different, they would have done something different. I fully agree. But you can't flaw their actions because of the scenario. They responded to the scenario. The scenario was a given, they responded. So picking at their actions, because you don't think the scenario is right, is a bit of a disconnect. We can say, what did you think the scenario should or should not have had that would have made a difference? I'm happy to have that conversation. But don't pick on the players because given the ways, means, and ends they had, they did what they did. They did what they did. That was the movie that they found themselves in. We can argue about the premise of the movie. We can argue about the setup to the movie. And then if you'd like a different setup, you'd like a different premise, okay, then let's run another game under those conditions. But the scenario isn't quote unquote inherently flawed. The scenario is what it is. It's usually only considered flawed if you've broken some rules of physics or you've done something just really grossly stupid, right? That is gonna be very difficult for people to get past the I believe point, okay? It's sort of like if I run a war game in 2022 and all of the, and the United States has scrapped all of our aircraft carriers, all right? That's gonna be really hard for people to get their heads around. Now, if I sit there and say, we understand this is a thought process, this is to imagine, because people would have had the same argument about battleships going into the beginning of World War II. <laughs> if I had said, well, what if there was a situation where all your frontline battleships were all taken out in an afternoon or a morning, then what would you do? Like, oh, that's a silly, that's a silly premise. Was it so silly? <laughs> okay. But make sure you're very clear about why you're creating the scenarios you are, and that you're not just simply trying to say, well, we're using our crystal ball to look into the future, and this is the way it's going to be. Because now you're being predictive, and predictive is one of those nasty words I say we don't try to use in wargaming. Um, your scenarios are no more so predictive than anything else you're doing. You're creating a situation. The sponsors are going to need to be, the reader, the consumer, is going to need to be able to, under, has to be able to understand that situation to then put the player's actions in context. But I'm not trying to sell you the scenario. And that's, I think we're, we spend an awful lot of time trying to sell the scenario. Scenario is what it is. Hopefully you find it relevant. Anything else? Oh, you know what we didn't do last time, Robert? Matter of fact, we, like, I forgot like two times in a row now. You know what it is? It's the game recommendation. So, okay, if there's no other questions, <laughs> I'll wander off on, my, on this game recommendation because I have to have it in arm's reach. So let's do this. Let's go. Because the, uh, the virtual background messes with, when I try to show a box. I don't think I, I don't think I've recommended this one before. Code names, anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Yeah, we've played it here at the Army War College, mostly for fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I love it. Great, great. Uh, 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 you know, stuck in the weekend in the cabin type of game. Um, this is one of these games where uh, they call it a party game, um, and it does work better, you know, with with a, a group of people. Um, there is a, a two player variant, but. I find it not nearly as satisfying as the at least four player and up uh, variant. Um, but these are one of these games where it's so accessible. You know, once people see it played once, I, I, I've got n numerous friends who are, are, are casual gamers at best. And if they play this game, they buy it uh, type of thing. So uh, it's a communications game, okay? In terms of you trying to communicate uh, uh, some, some uh, by, by wordplay. So this is a vocabulary building game if you've got kids. Um, uh, in order to try to communicate. And it's, it puts it in this context of, of secret agents and, and that type of thing. The, the thematics are pretty thin, I'll admit, uh, for what is essentially a wordplay game. But it's great fun. I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, and it's on my shelf. And it's one of my recommended games is Codenames. Okay, so that, that killed three minutes of our time here. Um, we're almost at the bottom of the hour. Any last, any last words? Okay, Robert, I think we're a wrap. Well, great. Uh, again, thank you very much. And again,